Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be back here at UH um, Manoa. My, my great thanks to Tokiko-san especially, and also John and everyone else involved um, for this wonderful opportunity to um, both to organize, to help organize an exhibition over in the art gallery um, and take part in this symposium and getting to hear all the wonderful talks that we've heard today. Um, so in this presentation, um, I will be sharing research. Here it is. I'll be sharing research I understood, uh, undertook as part of my master's thesis in art history um, here at UH, examining a hand scroll painting, which we've already looked at um, a little bit earlier today and also yesterday. Um, this is one of a pair of scrolls from the 1710 procession, um, now in the Sakamaki Hawley collection here at uh, UH's Hamilton Library. Um, I will present an iconographic analysis of this pr procession scroll, focusing on the individuals depicted and their respective roles within the embassy, and touching upon the symbolic or discursive significance of several aspects of these processions as display. As Yokoyama Sensei has already touched upon, um, as uh, several of the presenters have already touched upon, um, the 18 Ryukyuan procession, Ryukyuan missions sent to the shogunal capital of Edo during the Tokugawa period uh, served primarily a ritual function, offering on behalf of the king of Ryukyu his congratulations to a new shogun or his gratitude for the shogun's recognition of a new king taking the throne in Ryukyu. These missions usually consisted of roughly 75 to 100 people, all members of the, of the Ryukyuan scholar bureaucrat aristocracy, though on several occasions missions were double this size on occasions when there was both a new, sh a new shogun and a new king around the same time. The 1710 mission, um, which I will be discussing today, was one such mission, consisting of 168 individuals, along with an escort of roughly 4,000 samurai from Satsuma. This was one of the largest missions, second only to that in 1714, which had, I think, two or five more people involved. Along with similar missions from Korea, um, which we see here in a Japanese painting, um, circa 1748, um, as well as missions from the Dutch East India Company, um, who sent people up from Nagasaki. These Ryukyuan missions played an important discursive role in supporting the image of the shogunate's legitimacy and power by demonstrating exotic foreign peoples paying homage and tribute to the shogun. These missions also provided a rare opportunity for people of the Japanese archipelago, commoners, peasants, and samurai alike, particularly those who lived along the mission's travel route or in Edo, um, an opportunity for them to see foreigners in the flesh. The Ryukyuan missions, the Ryukyuan embassies, uh, typically spent roughly one month in Edo, being housed at one of the Satsuma uh, domain mansions, and visiting Edo Castle two or three times. Each time they traveled to or from the uh, palace, that is to say, uh, the shogun's castle, the members of the embassy, accompanied by an entourage of samurai from Satsuma, formed a grand procession and paraded through the streets of Edo, wearing colorful Chinese and Ryukyuan clothing, waving banners, and playing music. The spectacle was recorded in woodblock prints, books, and paintings by both commercial artists and painters in service to the shogunate. Roughly 100 hand scroll paintings like this one depicting the Ryukyuan processions are extant and known today, while another 100 extant scrolls depict the corresponding Korean uh, processions. In terms of woodblock printed books, which were, quite in, which were relatively inexpensive and widely available, more than 90 distinct titles uh, were produced over the course of the Edo period each of which would have been published in print runs of maybe one or 2,000 uh, individual copies, um, sometimes, maybe hundreds, hundreds to thousands. Um, a considerable amount of scholarship has already been done in Japanese um, on these Ryukyuan processions and on the various popular and official visual depictions of them. But while a few scholars have written in English about the political, symbolic, or discursive imp impacts of the processions, um, there remains extremely little scholarship in English providing the details of, for example, the individual roles and titles of members of the Ryukyuan embassies. Um, so it's hoped that this paper is kind of a very small first step towards what I am hoping to perhaps um, address in my PhD research, um, remedying that um, gap in the English scholarship. The 1710 processions depicted in the Sakamaki Holly Collection scroll are of particular significance as the 1710 mission set, set numerous precedents for all later missions, uh, chiefly in terms of the organization of the processions, um, the style of garments worn by officials of certain ranks, uh, the style and number of banners carried, and other such symbolic and ceremonial elements. Um, this may seem superficial, but in addition to providing a standard stylistic form by which we can describe and interpret the later processions um, by looking at this one, these stylistic visual elements were also of profound discursive and symbolic importance, 
reflecting a performance of cultural identity and sig signifying the level of prestige or power of the Ryukyuan ambassador, and therefore, by extension, um, the prestige or power of the entire kingdom. This scroll from the Sakamaki Holly Collection is one of a pair, each about 60 feet long, and both in uh, ink and mineral colors on paper. While the first scroll, which will be the focus of my talk today, depicts the Ryukyuan members of the embassy um, in procession, the second scroll depicts a procession of samurai, um, presumably the Satsuma escort accompanying the Ryukyuan procession, as well as towards the end, as we already saw a little bit um, in Yokoyama Sensei's talk, um, larger, more detailed depictions of banners, musical instruments, etc. Um, and this pattern of showing the procession and then later showing larger details is also very common in a lot of the um, woodblock printed books from this period. Now, unfortunately, the Hawaii scrolls bear no signature or artist seals, and nothing is known of their provenance um, prior to the pair coming into the collection of British uh, book collector Frank Hawley, who we've already talked about some today. Um, whose collection was acquired by the university following his death in 1961. Um, it's extremely difficult, if they're not impossible, therefore, to determine exactly who painted these scrolls, for whom, for what purpose, um, or exactly how often um, or in what context exactly they would have been opened up and viewed. One thing we can do, however, is to examine the subjects depicted within the scroll and through iconographic analysis and the aid of previous research, gain some more detailed understandings of the form and content of the processions. Uh, the scroll opens, as you can see here, with an inscription, which could be translated roughly, um, over here on the right, roughly as uh, seventh year of Hoei, that is to say 1710, eleventh month, eighteenth day, procession of both ambassadors, or two ambassadors, um, of the king of Chuzan Ryukyu up to the castle. The majority of the procession, as depicted in the scroll, consists of individuals of importance mounted on horseback or riding in a palanquin each surrounded by a group of low-ranking samurai, porters, and Ryukyuans on foot. These figures of importance are interspersed with sections of solely samurai and porters, often marching si single or double file. The procession is depicted in a con single continuous stream of figures from the beginning of the scroll to the end. Um, however, in describing and examining the painting, it's much easier and sort of more convenient to focus on individual uh, mounted figures sort of, and the people surrounding them as a group. Um, the first three mounted figures in the procession, two of whom we see here, are clearly marked as samurai by the pair of swords at their waists, by the kariginu hunting jacket that they wear. Um, and each of these three figures is identified by an inscription above their head indicating their rank or title um, and their name, uh, as all of the mounted or palanquin riding figures in the scroll are also identified um, by their rank or title. Um, these three samurai are the only, fig the only mounted figures in Japanese garb in the first of these two scrolls. And the remainder of the figures that we will see um, who are mounted or, or, or riding in palanquins are all Ryukyuan, although a lot of people on foot are sort of low-ranking samurai escorts. Um, and we can tell that everybody else in the scroll is Ryukyuan and not Japanese based on their clothes and also by their very Ryukyuan titles. So the first Ryukyuan figure that we see in the scroll is identified by an inscription above his head as the Giese, who we've already seen in the 1671 scroll. Um, and he's the head of the processions, musicians, and entertainers, specifically the street musicians, the ones who are actually performing in the, pr in the procession. He is mounted on horseback and accompanied by a number of samurai in black and brown haori, uh, porters in blue, and three other Ryukyuans. The Ryukyuan figures can be easily distinguished by their long robes, which extend all the way down to the ground, um, and by their long hair worn up in buns, in contrast to the Japanese samurai custom of shaving the top of the head. Two of the samurai accompanying the Giese along with many, um, many, many more and later groups of the procession are labeled here, um, here, and here as um, hokoshi or kachishi, spe specific using the character for aruku to walk, uh, specifically designating these men as accompanying on foot. Throughout the scroll, the Ryukyuan figures are distinguished from the Japanese ones primarily by their clothing, hairstyle, and though it might be a little bit too small to see here by their, their facial hair. Um, Returning to the Giese, the inscription tells us not only his role within the procession, that is to say that he is the Giese for this procession, um, but it also gives his aristocratic title, Sakumoto Pechin. Now, unlike the Japanese names that we saw earlier, um, names like Wakamatsu and Hikobe, um, Sakamoto and Pechin are not names. They're not surnames or given names. Um, and none of the Ryukyuan figures here are actually given by some kind of actual given name. They're identified only by their titles. Um, Sakamoto Pechin might be very loosely translated, and I'm sure there's a better 
way to, uh, but it might be very loosely translated as Lord of Sakumoto, some ranking within that, however we want to translate it, but Sakumoto being a place name and Pechin being a particular rank of aristocracy. Um, Pechin is the Okinawan pronunciation, roughly, of um, the term that we see here written with the characters Oya Kumo Ue, uh, right here, Oya Kumo and Ue, um, and it was a sort of a middling rank within the Ryukyuan aristocracy. As we go through the scroll, we'll see a lot of figures of different um, ranks, and we'll start to get a sense of the, uh, the ranks that exist in the aristocracy. So this first image allows us opportunity to talk about quite a few elements which will appear time and again later in the scroll. First of all, in addition to his title, Sakamoto Pechin being clearly a Ryukyuan title and not a Japanese one, we can further identify that he's definitely Ryukyuan based on um, uh, because he's not wearing samurai robes or um, swords at his, at his belt. Now this particular style of hat, um, seen over here with the um, wings sticking out to the side, is a standard form for a Chinese court cap from the Ming Dynasty. His robes likewise are in the style of a Ming Dynasty court official with an emblem called a buza on his chest. Uh, normally the creature depicted on a Chinese official's emblem um, and the color were indications of his rank within the Ming court. Um, as Sakamoto Pechin is a Ryukyuan official and therefore does not have a rank within the Ming court, I'm not positive exactly what kind of design his emblem ought to be bearing. But anyway, we will talk, we'll come back to this idea of Chinese court clothing. Um, so the Giese, the head of the street musicians, is followed unsurprisingly by a group of street musicians who are preceded by um, a pair of flag bearers carrying banners that's, that read Golden Drum and followed by a pair of banners bearing images of tigers. Um, these two elements are quite standard in depictions of Ryukyuan processions as we've already started to see this morning. We always see tiger banners and um, only rarely dragons um, or something else. And we always see the phrase golden drum uh, rather than sort of any mixture of other phrases. Though I've yet to find an explanation of the meaning or symbolism of these particular elements. And I guess we, will, we can discuss that or perhaps Yokoyama Sensei knows better. Um, and I would look forward to learning about it. In the next section, we see a riderless horse identified as Kenjoba a horse to be presented as a gift or as tribute. Several of the smaller Ryukyuan islands, particularly um, Yonaguni and Miyako, have had their own horse breeds for centuries. And horses were a very common tribute item given by the Ryukyu kingdom to both Japan and to China. Next in the procession after that is um, Makia Pechin, the Gyoshi, meaning head groom or horse steward. And he was the embassy's chief official in charge of overseeing all the horses. The last major figure that we come to before the lead ambassador is the shokanshi, or secretary. Um, we've already seen a shokanshi from the 1671 scroll. Um, he was responsible for handling and managing all of the um, high-level diplomatic documents and other formal documents uh, to be given and received by the ambassadors. Now, finally, towards the very middle of the scroll, um, so we're about 30 feet in now, uh, we come to Prince Misato, or Misato Oji, one of two lead ambassadors on this mission. He wears Ming court robes and rides in a lavish vermilion painted uh, Chinese style sedan chair. He's preceded by a large red umbrella and by the various other ban banners, musicians, spears, and halberds that we've already seen on the previous slides. And he's followed immediately, as we can see here also, by two more, um, two more spears or halberds and an umbrella. Uh, Constantine Vaporis, in a recent book on um, Sankin Kotai or alternate attendance missions, the daimyo processions, noted that in the case of those processions, the number of spears or halberds, as well as traveling chests and certain other accoutrements fit into a complex symbolic scheme indicating the rank or level of prestige or power of that daimyo. Um, in those Sankin Kotai processions, he writes, a member of the Tokugawa branch families would be immediately preceded and followed by a total of four spears, two in front and two behind, um, indicating his high rank. While a very powerful or, or prominent Tozama daimyo, like um, the Shimazu Lord, would be preceded by two spears and followed by one for a total of three. It's unclear exactly how this applies in the Ryukyuan procession, um, how many that we see two here with an umbrella and two more in front. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly how that fits into the same scheme or whether it's a separate scheme, but it certainly plays some kind of role in indicating the level of prestige of the uh, ambassador and therefore by extension the whole kingdom. Um, now the title prince or oji in Japanese can be a, mis a bit misleading. In the Ryukyuan court hierarchy, there were two types of princes. There were those who were directly related to the royal family, who placed somewhere in the line of succession, as in our typical usage of the word prince. 
but then a Ryukyuan prince could also be a high-ranking aristocrat who had been granted the title of prince, um, the highest title a court noble could hold, simply as a reward for meritorious service or the like, even without being directly related to um, the royal family. Um, following the lead envoy, we see um, Miyagusaku Pechin, who's another shokanshi or secretary. There's one secretary for each of the two missions. And you'll remember that I noted that the 1710 mission was a double mission. So we have two lead envoys, two vice envoys, two shokanshi, um, and in total, roughly twice as many members of the procession um, altogether. Prince Misato, who we saw a moment ago, um, was the lead ambassador for the mission congratulating Tokugawa Ienobu on having become shogun. And just, be just behind him in the procession, we now have Prince Tomigusuku, who's the lead ambassador for the mission thanking the shogun for his recognition of Shoeki as the new king of Ryukyu. Uh, so let's talk for a moment about the style of court costume that we see each of these figures wearing. All of the Ryukyuan officials that we have seen so far on horseback or in palanquins are, riding chi uh, are wearing Chinese-style court costume. Uh, while all of those on foot, um, such as a few of these figures here gathered around um, on foot around the lead ambassador's palanquin, um, they're all wearing Ryukyuan court costume, a long flowing robe that extends down to the ground and is sort of simply wrapped around one's body, um, kind of like a kimono. Um, and some of these men on foot are wearing a turban-like cap called a hachimaki in Japanese. Um, but you can see that it's really quite different from um, what the uh, ambassador himself is wearing. Um, like in the classical Japanese court, certain periods, I think maybe pre-Nara pre period, uh, similarly in the Ryukyuan court, the color of one's hachimaki, the color of one's cap, was an indication of your rank. Uh, here we have some further depictions of Ryukyuan on the left and Ming Chinese on the right court, uh, court garb, so you can kind of get a sense of the uh, differences in style. The figures on the left are wearing Ryukyuan court robes, and, hachi and one of them is wearing a hachimaki court cap, uh, just like the figures on foot in the scroll that I was just pointing at. The figures on the right are wearing Ming court costume, like the named mounted figures in the scroll. Um, the Chinese and Ryukyuan court costume, Ryukyuan music, banners, spears, and halberds in a Ryukyuan or Chinese style, as well as the hairstyles, facial hair, and, some, and otherwise somewhat foreign appearance of the Ryukyuan people themselves, all combined to create an impression of foreignness, an impression of the exotic for Japanese onlookers. The terms, most often, uh, the terms that I've seen most often used in contemporary documents are to no yo or kara no fu, which can mean either Chinese style specifically or exotic or foreign in general. Um, the more exotic Ryukyu appeared, the greater the prestige of both Satsuma as the only daimyo domain to claim a foreign kingdom as its vassal, and of the shogunate to which this foreign kingdom is paying tribute and homage. Now, up until very recently, the scholarship, both in Japanese and in English, has indicated that this foreignness or exoticness of the processions was very deliberately and artificially constructed by the Satsuma authorities um, via an edict declared in 1709. The edict is cited as specifying particular types or styles of garments, weapons, and other accoutrements to carry, and that in the words of one historian, quote, their equipment above all must be of the sort used in a foreign court so that they cannot be mistaken for Japanese. Um, in a recent essay, however, um, Tomiyama Kazuyuki pointed out that this phrasing does not actually appear in the 1709 edict, um, which in the conventional scholarly narrative had a profound impact in the 1710 mission uh, and, and all later missions, resulting in these missions being more of a fiction created to serve Satsuma's interest rather than an authentic representation of Ryukyuan style or Ryukyuan cultural identity. Um, he traces, Tomiyama traces this misinterpretation um, to an item of pre-war scholarship, which all these later works cite or draw upon, whether directly or indirectly. Um, so as the standard interpretation colors our understanding of the Ryukyuan missions as being chiefly a product of the domineering, oppressive thumb of Satsuma control, I think, it's, uh, I think this point of revision is, rather, is a rather important one, recovering a degree of Ryukyuan agency in how they wanted to represent themselves in these processions. Uh, we're now roughly halfway through the scroll. Bear with me. Um, let us continue to think about these sort of greater, broader issues as we, can, as we return to the iconographic description of the figures depicted in the scroll. Um, now, we saw the two lead envoys, or seishi, uh, riding in lavish vermilion red Chinese style sedan chairs, koshi, um, in which they are elevated above the surrounding figures on foot. Now, we see Yoza Uekata, the second of two vice envoys, or fukushi, riding in a Japanese style palanquin, a kago which hangs below the carrying poles and which is much plainer in color. This makes a certain degree of sense. Uh, he is, after all, 
uh, Uwe Kata, which is a lower court rank than the lead envoys, who are princes. Um, and of course, he's also vice envoy, not lead envoy. Um, so this, and this arrangement that the lead envoys were always princes and the vice envoys were always Uwe Kata um, became pretty standard. It is curious, however, given the preponderance of Chinese and Ryukyuan elements um, in these processions, banners, costumes, etc., cetera, um, that we should now see Japanese-style palanquins. This is more or less the only uh, very overtly Japanese-style element um, in the processions outside of the Japanese figures themselves, the samurai themselves. Um, daimyo in their Sankin Kotai processions to and from Edo most often rode a horse, retreating to a palanquin only when it rained and in certain other, uh, and in other, certain other circumstances. And even then, Vaporis tells us, quote, not all lords were anxious to use one even in, even in inclement weather. This would seem to suggest that riding on horseback was, at least in the Sankin Kotai context or in the samurai context, a position of prestige, more so than the kago, um, or at least a more comfortable or more enjoyable ride. Uh, the, reverse, the reverse would appear to be true in the case of the Ryukyuan processions, given that these higher ranking ue kata are riding in kago, while the lower ranking pechin that we saw earlier, such as the giese uh, musician and the shokanshi secretaries, were on horseback. Um, I hope to look into these questions of symbolism of rank and prestige uh, more in the course of my PhD research. Moving forward, we encounter the two Sangi Khan, um, Aragusuku Pechin and Shikenbaru Pechin, both wearing Ming style court costume and mounted on horseback. The Sangi Khan were aides to the vice envoys, the Fukushi, and played a role in overseeing all ceremonial activities of the, of the missions. And since these missions were primarily ceremonial endeavors, this was of particular importance. While in Edo, the ambassadors usually had two or three audiences with the shogun, um, during which they presented gifts and offered formal greetings. All of the exchanges and interactions between the envoys and the shogun were highly formalized and served a ritual purpose of representing, if not the, king, the Riku kingdom's submission per se, if we don't want to use that word, then uh, the relationship between the kingdom and the shogunate or between the king and the shogun, um, however we may choose to term it, all of this was not merely for show in some sort of uh, lighthearted kind of way. The show itself, the ritual performance itself, was of extremely great importance in Tokugawa political discourse. Now, coming towards the very end of it, um, towards the end of the procession, we, we see the gakusei, um, the head of the embassy's chamber musicians and performers. You'll remember that towards the very beginning, we saw the giese, who's the head of the street musicians. So now we see the head of the chamber musicians, um, who would have performed only indoors, either at Edo Castle for the shogun or at the Satsuma Mansion for um, other uh, high-ranking samurai lords. The gakuse is followed by eight gakudoji, who are young men roughly 15 to 18 years of age, who are musicians and dancers. All eight gakudoji are of satunushi rank, which is a rank below pechin, um, and close to the lowest of the aristocratic ranks. These young men, when they are a bit older, however, have the potential to be promoted um, up higher. Note that unlike all of the other previous mounted um, figures that we've seen who are wearing Ming court costume with the sort of winged hats, the Gakudoji now wear um, Ryukyuan style robes, have their long hair tied up in buns on top of their heads, and wear golden hairpins in the Ryukyuan fashion. The final group of figures are 14 officials called Shisan, who were um, responsible for taking care of a variety of errands or tasks um, for the lead and, and deputy envoys. Unlike the officials in Ming costume that we've seen previously, these Shisan also are wearing Ryukyuan robes and uh, Hachimaki court caps. Now, one of the Shisan on the 1710 mission is of particular note. Um, Tamagusa Kuchokun is there. Tamagusa Kuchokun, um, identified as Tamagusa Kupechin on the scroll, um, was, as, we've, as Professor Smith touched upon earlier, um, the founder of the Okinawan dance drama form known as Kumi Odori, or Kumi Udui in Okinawan. And, and as such, he's today one of the most prominent and celebrated figures in the history of Okinawan performing arts. I was kind of excited to find, to discover him on this scroll. Um, and so with that, we finally come to the end of the scroll, the first of two, if you'll remember. Um, the seal that we see here at the end of the scroll is, uh, it reads Horei Bunko, and it's the seal of collector Frank Hawley, uh, which brings us back around to the beginning of my presentation. <clears throat> My initial intention in tackling this topic and examining this scroll um, was to connect it into an argument uh, involving theories of media discourse um, about how the people of early modern Japan depicted Ryukyu, how they viewed Ryukyu, and how they understood or misunderstood Ryukyu. 
for, for popularly published materials, such as a single sheet ukiyo-e woodblock print or printed books, um, which we have some sense of you know, how many were made and how they circulated. There's a lot of scholarship on how popular media in the Edo period worked. For those things, it was quite a bit easier. However, the lack of information on the artist or the provenance of this piece, whether, whether it was created as an official record for the event, as several of the presenters today have talked about, um, an official record in visual form for the shogunate, or whether it was produced by a uh, machi eshi, a town painter, um, for some interested private party or some kind of more popular commercial work, um, albeit an expensive one. Um, we don't know which one it is, so it has made it difficult to attempt to tackle how this object would have functioned uh, discursively. Indeed, though existing scholarship indicates that many scrolls were, uh, were created for such official and non-official purposes, of all scrolls that I've read about or seen reproductions of in catalogs um, or in other you know, scholarship, none have been explicitly described you know, in that exhibition catalog as being known to have been created in a particular context, context or for a particular purpose. Um, I hope that through further research I might be able to happen upon some great discovery that sheds light on these matters. In the meantime, however, I'm afraid I have little to offer by way of analytical or sort of deep interpretive conclusions. So any suggestions you may have would be most appreciated. Ipe nife debiru. Mahalo.